Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello and welcome back to the 40 Orty podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Today, we've got I dread to say a different episode than usual, even. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about something that is perhaps quite, as most people would say, triggering or difficult or emotional. We're, we're going to be talking about autism and suicide and, you know, everything that comes along with it, things to do with depression, things to do with mental health support. Um, we're going to be talking about our particular experiences with it. So if that's something that you are um, thinking to yourself, oh my God, like, I, d- I don't want to spiral myself out and I'm not in a good place to listen to this, then um, I would I would encourage you to, um, to check out one of your other episodes. But if not, I'm sure this is going to be a really great conversation. And um, I forgot to introduce my guest. Um, we have Amelia here from Autistic Positivity. Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine, thank you. How, how are you doing today? How's your week been so far? Um, a little stressful with stuff at school, but I guess I'm okay. What 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 kind of stuff are you studying at the moment? Is it just like the all the bases, or is like oh yeah, few subjects the the, that... the bases just mm, you know school is quite stressful by itself and um i'm failing maths actually (laughs) so um i'm trying to work on that yeah yeah no i i i really struggled with with maths i had this absolutely awful teacher um who was very very like authoritarian like oh. it's like nobody <laughs> speaks, and if you speak, then you get to strike across your name, and if you get three strikes, then you're off to detention. Oh. And um, he didn't like me because I took everything that he said very literally. <laughs> so he said, "You can talk when you finished working." So I finished working very quickly, and then I talked, and then he got annoyed at me, and so he moved me down to like a lower set, um, <laughs> which is lovely of him. Would you like to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Amelia, as you know. I started Autistic Positivity on Instagram in, I think, November last year. That is 2021. Um, So I am autistic. I was diagnosed when I was 16. Um, And yeah, my special interests include autism and mental health. So um, I really love what I do. What are your what are your sort of plans like after after you finish finish school and you are you going to go into work or are you going to kind of stick to online stuff or go to university? What are your um, plans? So uh, when I got my disability papers, uh, there was a note that said I'm not able to work, and uh, yeah, I, I I agree with that. Um, so no plans at the moment, but I'm really hoping to grow my platform and help even more people. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you will. And you've already done some like really great, great work. I think. <laughs> Thank you. I can't remember what post I saw. It might have been something related to mental health, but um, oh, okay. I think it it is a really really important topic, isn't it? Yeah, um, it is. I think it might might be sort of quite quite good to go through some statistics on mental health because I mean I mean it's I know I didn't say that I'd do this at the start of the podcast but I have I have my presentation up for the autism show that I'll be doing this weekend and um I looked at the new research and there's like some real like it's 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 very depressing when I see it but I see the the potential of sort of showing these these stats to people 
Yeah. Um, so at, at the moment, 22% of autistic people are in either full-time or part-time employment. 40% have lifelong depression. 20% anxiety have anxiety disorders. 63% of autistic uh, people in school um, are bullied significantly. 63%. Autistic people actually have an in increased rate of mortality, so dying about 20 years on average earlier. Yeah, that's true. 66% of people, autistic people, think you know, seriously about suicide, and 35% of people attempt. You know, further to that, 41% of suicides in a, in a recent study, um, they did like a big sort of analysis of like mental, mental health and, and suicides and sort of mm -hmm, talking yeah. to the family and stuff. 41% of those suicides that they surveyed had, they showed strong autistic traits. You know, start, starting with these <laughs> statistics, it kind of gives us a bit of a, um, a framework because I know some people who kind of may tune into us speaking and think that it's kind of like an isolated case or it's it's something that's not very common but um it actually is yeah i guess you know jumping into our our first question after me rambling about stats <laughs> <laughs> no i think it's uh, important to talk about those i think so too and def definitely in the context of this <laughs> yeah this talk um so what are some of the reasons that autistic people are more likely to attempt suicide i think that's a bit that's it's a very punchy question right to the to the heart of things um yeah what do you think about that mm, so i think that the first um like a factor first factor is um where more likely to be socially isolated. Mm. There are autistics that um, struggle with uh, with socializing at yeah, and um, we may have issues to go out or meet with friends or even make friends. So sure. that um, you know when you're isolated for. Um, the majority of your life or um, when you're at school when where friends are really important that puts you at risk at either depression or even suicidal thoughts um mm. yeah or attempts even because of it because you feel so alone and like you don't have anybody to talk to mm. i think that's that's a really important a really important point because um you know, across the board, it seems to be a trend that autistic people just receive a lot of trauma from um, going through the high school, secondary oh, yeah. school experience. Is that is that something that you've that you've you've experienced? Uh, so I never was really bullied, um, but the kids definitely. Uh, as I was saying, I was diagnosed at sixteen, so I didn't know I was aut autistic, uh, but the kids definitely knew that there was there was something wrong with me or I was different. Mm -hmm. They were talking behind my back, definitely, that time, the weird one. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine what, um, what these people who are bullied must go through. Mm. It's, it's definitely something that I've, um, I've taught, I've talked about it quite a lot, but I, I, I really struggled in secondary school with, with bullies and stuff. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why I started doing martial arts and Taekwondo. Um, because it was just, uh, it was, it's, it's quite difficult because it's not like, um, there's a rule book for, for bad interactions with people. Oh, it's yeah. like most people just say, <laughs> walk away or something. Some people will say, hit him, hit him back, hit him first. Or like, yeah, it's not <laughs> always that easy. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but I've also seen a lot of isolation, like social isolation in older autistic people. Like, oh, yeah. Who have been like, re like really late in, late in the life diagnosis, you know? Yes. Um, a lot of people sort of 
messaging and, and commenting on on my stuff about their their sort of circumstances. They kind of masked all their life and had really bad experiences with people. Yeah. And, you know, due due to all of that, um, pretty much just live alone and perhaps like Yes. You know, some some people will say that, you know, they, they don't need social interaction because they're autistics. We don't need social interaction. <laughs> But well, um, I'm you not may sure about feel that. like it, but I, I don't think it's really true. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a it's a big part for everybody, I think. Yes, um, even if we don't enjoy it that much, I think we we need it either way. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like a bit of therapy, isn't it? Oh well, yeah, it can be. Yeah, even even in situations where I find it really stressful, I always feel sort of it's it's just good to kind of have someone to talk to as like a a sounding board you know because yes most of the time we're kind of always in our head thinking about things and interactions and people and concepts and it can just it can get a little bit too much sometimes it's good to like voice them and get them out of your brain (laughs) (laughs) yeah definitely i agree well, I, I think that, you know, one of the other sort of factors um, that's really become more apparent to me as time goes on is uh, misdiagnosis or being undiagnosed or not knowing that you're autistic. Yes. Um, like people people getting a diagnosis of like BPD, specifically women around, around BPD and um, psychosis even schizophrenia yes yes mm-hmm. um and i know there's been a little bit of history with you know that kind of crossover but um from listening to people it seems that it's a really bad it's it's really bad for them because they, they kind of shuttled through this mental health pathway which is not sort of specialized or friendly to autistic people like, yes i can say um, by looking at my story, I was uh, misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Disorder, um, and I didn't really see any of those traits in myself. It's like mm. diagnosing diagnosing autism would be a bad thing. I felt like um, I did show a lot of autistic traits at the time. Mm. Yeah, and definitely being undiagnosed for the, well, most of my life is a huge plays a huge uh, role mm. in my mental health, in my struggles. Um, it can be due to services that I received being uh, unaccommodated for autistic people or the specialist who treated me didn't really know how to support me yeah. because yeah they didn't know i was autistic and autistic um, people should be should be accommodated in receiving those uh, services whether Definitely. it's um online therapy is instead of uh, going to the place or um, well, yeah, there's, there's uh, a whole list I could make of accommodations, but uh, you know what I mean. I mean, <laughs> mm. yeah, definitely. I think it's 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 really important to kind of go back to, um, you know, why why people just attempt suicide anyway. Like, I think it's you know, f- f- at least from my experiences, it's it's. It's it's either been something that I feel is my only way out of discomfort or pain yes. or emotional difficulties, um, but it's it's also been like a little bit of you know in sort of a maladaptive way. It's a, it's a little bit of a, a coping mechanism at times. It's like um, for me, it's like oh okay, you know. I can't, I'm gonna go for this, but you know it does. It doesn't really matter because you know I I could just I, I can end it when I want to, and um, you know that 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 kind of mentality around things. Yes. Um, it's kind of like a, it's like the, the 
the, the person's coping mechanism to deal with an environment or circumstances or a brain that just just causes you a lot of distress and pain yes. and difficulty and I can, I can imagine like when we're talking about it in like the context of autism it's um you know you've got things like alexithymia and you know things like that that kind of yes come they in make and, it harder to receive support or even realize that you need it mm, definitely um and also also like factors of quality of life like unemployment um difficulty yes. finding a relationship difficulty finding friends you know yeah, being able that to pay can, your way that can play a huge role too just like you shared those statistic with uh, statistics with unemployment in autistic people um not having maybe work sometimes can be can feel like a purpose to live maybe um and you also find a community there uh, friends you have a boss you have a job that you have to um, attend to you have to get out of bed every day uh, so that can be helpful but also of course exhausting and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so we, when we can't can't work we may feel isolated um and yeah difficulty finding friends or partner is something that we struggle with too and that can also play a role in for example depression or even suicide yeah yeah like it's 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 a it's a really difficult one because it's there's a lot of sort of um avenues for um autistic people receiving a lot of bad life experiences like like what we said about anxiety and just rates of depression and yes. rates of bullying unemployment isolation you know it's the role like also trauma um different kinds i don't know maybe in family uh, mm. at school we mentioned that yeah i i, I like the um I, th I think you might have point pointed it out but like um social isolation it doesn't necessarily have to be something that occurs um when you're just on your own all the time like yeah i think you know uh, another thing that's that's really sort of popular to talk about at the moment um is like masking and yes things like that like the sort of existential sort of feeling that anyone that you meet or that you talk to who likes you and is a part of your life like because you have this mask up all the time you don't really yeah. feel connected to the people around you like yes it's um i read somewhere that uh, side effects of long-term masking can be um depression anxiety loss of identity and also depression mm. and uh, suicidal thoughts so it's definitely important to mention that um it's like we interact with somebody and it's like the person who talks to us meets a another person a different person someone mm. that um, we we just put up an act we don't feel like ourselves anymore sometimes when we mask I think it's it's also as well like we you know obviously we need to put in a lot more effort into sort of interacting and maintaining friendships and yes. you know, things things of that nature so if people aren't like if they, if the only thing that people have experienced is is negativity or or not connecting with people when they talk to them then you know that that anxiety social anxiety and those um, social difficulties are going to be way out of order with their desire to to talk yeah. to people in my life i went through a, a big phase in my in my second year of university where um i was kind of in a situation where i'd moved away from home and you know one of one of the issues about it is that you're not exactly surrounded by people all the time 
yeah. you, in in adult life, and you kind of have to like go and find people. <laughs> yes, um, that's true. Which which is the difficulty. And I, I was on my own for like a like a month or so, and I, I didn't really go outside, and I was just very. And it, it had re- some really bad effects on making my anxiety and panic attacks and like depression worse because it's it's like you're just stuck alone with your with your thoughts Yourself, sometimes. Yeah. I guess what I what I really want to know is, you know, um, one of the the reasons why I asked you to come on is because I was, you know, interested in hearing what your experiences of of mental health um were like. Would you be able to to sort of give us a little bit of a, a story time on <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> love, love. hope there's no pressure on you, on you. i can always edit it <laughs> okay so my depression started when i was 12 i also had wow. anxiety now the anxiety is mm, very low i don't feel that much anymore but how however the depression is um sometimes unbearable um, when I was 13, I started self-harming. The mm. self-harm mm, kind of got worse. And I don't, of course, I won't uh, describe the uh, details, but sure. it's, it got worse from uh, July, August. Okay, in August, <laughs> I uh, took pills, but mm. I didn't really know anything about the dosage so it failed as you see <laughs> yeah. um and about a month from that i got admitted into a psych ward i was there for a month and a week and oh um God. yeah i don't want to scare you uh it's important <laughs> to <laughs> remember that i am in poland the mental health services and especially psych wards and especially child uh, psych wards are extremely underfunded Uh, but I talked to a psychologist for maybe 30 minutes two times during my stay there and uh, um, a stay of a month and a month and a half and Yes. He's talked to a psychologist twice. Yeah. <laughs> and my visits with uh, the psychiatrist were really like a physical exam or uh, just talking about, I don't know, my family or when will I get discharged from there. And oh so gosh. the food was also terrible. I, as you may know, I have ARFIT, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So. Uh, and I also didn't know that it existed then. I thought I was just weird. Um, so the food wasn't... Um, I ate only bread there, really. And maybe a pasta without any sauce, if I was lucky. Um, oh, my God. Yes. I, uh, at the end, all the psycholog- psychiatrists and psychologists um quit their job so the <laughs> the world was closed <laughs> i'm laughing now but it's of course so scary. the ward was closed and that's why you were discharged there was a doctor when i was this i was um near my discharge date uh, yeah. from another hospital but it happened when i was there and i avoided the the closing but um yeah so i got home i was really controlled by my parents and well it's not really that weird when your child wants to end their life it's i think it's natural to want to know what i what they are doing um yeah. and i self harmed pretty bad but when i got to the doctor the <laughs> He mm. said that there's an ocean of books that I should read to get better and life is beautiful. 
he was around 70. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he treated my <laughs> self-harm wound that required stitching. Um, but remember, if you're self-harming and your wounds don't require stitching, it's just as important as those who, um, mm. who it's require It's not a competition. It. Yes, yeah. yes, it's not a competition. And I don't want anybody to... Um, I forgot the word, uh, compare themselves to me. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I, uh, like four or three days ago, uh, from this incident at the doctor's, I was, uh, having a psychosis attack. Um, mm, and what? yeah, I think it's for, it was from depression. The, uh, I read somewhere that depression can cause psychotic attacks. Hmm. And, uh, I was 13 at the time. I didn't know what was You're happening. 13. Yes. Yes. Um, it felt like I taken, I don't know, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking like I was really heavily drunk. <laughs> um, that the world is in our hands or something. I was texting all my friends or the um, group chats with this bull. Yeah. And my mom <laughs> called the uh, uh, ambulance and they gave me, I don't know if you will know what it's called in English, if I will tell you, hydroxyzina. Hydroxyzine. 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 Yeah, they yeah. gave me two of those. And oh, I hate I hate hydroxine. It I makes my brain do. so it, I just can't <laughs> focus on anything like Yes. I, I took that for a while for sleeping but it didn't really work. Mm. And um after this incident I was uh, my parents told me that I'm going to a psych ward just for some um some tests. Uh, for a few hours, of course, I was there for another month. <laughs> um, and um, can, I, can I just? I don't. I don't. I don't want to sort of interrupt okay, your flow okay. or anything. Okay. But I, I just find it absolutely incomprehensible about like how how men, how healthcare professionals or or people think that it's it's a suitable thing to. To basically just lock up someone who's who's recently like attempted or someone who's who's self harmed quite badly and yeah and only see them twice once for a physical exam yeah and then ex expect when they're released for them to be to be okay in a better, or, into yes. in a better state <laughs> and <laughs> like, <laughs> not to return there anymore. Um. Well, it's but you'd be worse, aren't you? It's because it's a horrible experience. So you yes. It's maybe a little bit traumatized me. The patients helped me a, a lot more than the actual doctors. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and this psych ward was um, the doctors and the psychologists were a little bit more, um, uh, well, they were talking to us, but the you had an individual con consultation with the psychologist just once a uh, in a week which yeah. is also not ideal but still better um the but individual was... or individual or group kind of yes there was also something called group ther ther sorry therapy <laughs> but <laughs> it was just smelling candles and the psychologist reading us children's stories, children's books. So that what? was. <laughs> and <laughs> the patients there were like 14 or 15. Yeah, there's the ch children, sorry. But <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. That's. Yeah. And. I, t <laughs> the, not, you, you, I know you're saying about. Um, you know this 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 situation being in Poland. Yes. But I've heard I've heard a lot of stories from people in the US and the UK who, 
you know, going. It's it. I have to say, it's not quite as bad as that as having really bad, bad it's food. It's so and, bad, I know. Yeah, and um, like the environments that they put you in from yes. from going going to these places are just like the worst. Like you, you're huddled together with other people who are really struggling. Yes, and you're you're expected to eat certain things and go to sleep at certain times and wake up at certain times and like yes it's like it's like more of a prison like a short term oh, like yes, we'll put yes. a we'll put like a a time out on them and then they'll yes, so they'll be they released. won't kill themselves <laughs> <laughs> just not helping them but uh, it's Delaying. just for them yes yes um and uh i have a question actually you're in the uk Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. But I had a question: If uh, psych wards in America are paid, uh, as mm. there is only private healthcare. Mm. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm not too sure about that. I um. Well, no, maybe I can. It's I can only... voluntary hold. Maybe the bill isn't really that um, mm. high. If it's if there is a bill. Hmm. Maybe you probably know more about it than I do. <laughs> I, I just the only thing I know about this situation, like the what do you call it, psych wards and things like that, mm -hmm. is that they are not great for autistic yes. people, and um, and also that uh, there's you know e even within my my workplace, there's there's people within my workplace trying to like pass do like training and pass pass laws to like mm -hmm. prevent autistic people going going to psych wards because it's yes. just like it's su such a not adapted to us even in the uk um, yeah not heard some not heard good stories about it but yeah um but But yes, um, I can't remember where you, where you were in your story before I um, rudely interrupted. In this weird group ther therapy thing, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the f I don't eat, for example, pasta that's mixed with something else, and they just gave it to me and told me that um, I have to eat it. Mm. Um, so definitely not adapted to eating disorders in general, I think that a lot of psych wards are, um, for example, for patients with anorexia, they just are like, you have to eat it. And mm. there's not a lot of therapy and maybe talking, talking to that mm. issue. Um, yeah, cause I suppose even in that situation, if you're, you know, you're still, you're still delaying stuff because you, yes. you're putting a, a Band-Aid on them Yes, not yes. eating and just forcing them to eat, and yes. then like when they're released, when they when they get out, they're mm -hmm. like they're gonna have even more negative things attached to eating. Yes, and, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I got out of the psych ward and I never returned there. Hooray. Thankfully, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I started. Um, family therapy and we are in still in this therapy um, sure. and um, I started my own uh, I think it was psychodynamic therapy with elements of cognitive beha beha mm. behavioral sorry therapy CBT uh, yes CBT I was there for a year, then my therapist changed. I was there for another year and uh, she left work. I went to a different therapist in, uh, oh, I forgot the month again. The... It doesn't matter. The months, you don't have to worry about the months. <laughs> uh, June, July, August. I'm not going to fact August. check you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I went to another therapist in August of 2021, but we didn't really click. It yeah. sometimes it's like that, and I left. I started therapy, therapy again uh, actually two weeks ago, and she referred me to another therapist. Um, sure. I had different meds, 
Um, right now I'm on, oh, I don't know if I would know the uh, English you can try. version. I, I do have, I have um, <laughs> some knowledge of, of medical prescriptions. Um, um, so it's Venlafaxine, I think. Venlafaxine. Venlafaxine, it's Faxo something. Um, Venlafaxine. Phenelic. Phenelixine. Vela, um, a mono monoamine oxidase inhibitor used to treat atypical depression. Oh yeah. Phenelzine. Uh, so I'm on that, and I'm also on uh, again. Not sure of the English version. Quetapine with a Q. Quetapine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna gonna do a bit of a pharmacology class here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's used to treat uh, schizophrenia and uh, psychosis. I mm. take it for sleep. It really helps, but it's it's strong when it kicks. I mm. just <laughs> you're out. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot of the the schizophrenia type medication is is very very highly sedative isn't it yes like, and it's actually not meant to treat children i started it when i was like um 15 uh so it's a bit of a medical experiment <laughs> they also gave it gave it to us in the hospital um yeah. So we are just well. It's not not really the first choice you would make with anti antipsychotics to mm. treat um, insomnia. But yeah, it works. <laughs> that's I, that's important. And I find <laughs> that really 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 interesting because um, yeah, uh, I I've gone through the the medical circuit. As it mm -hmm. as it be, a few times for changing medications and yes, like, started for for depression. I started with fluoxetine, which is Prozac. Oh, I um, me too. <laughs> and sertraline, <laughs> uh, which was awful, and I've only oh. heard bad things about sertraline, apart from one person. But I'm still mm -hmm. not sure about that one. Um, and now I, I'm I'm currently on citalopram, which. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I did that too. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm searching now. Tolem, Estipratolem, I think it's what it's called. It's a similar um, substance An to... SSRI. Yeah. It's, yes. um, it's, uh, it's still like one of the sort of the more modern antidepressants. Yes. Like I know that the more... The more dated the antidepressants get, the more likely they are to have side effects and That's issues true. and things that you can't do when you're on them and that kind yes. of thing. And um, I, I'm also I'm also on a sedative medication for sleep as well, <laughs> um, called metazapine, which is um, it. I mean, it's 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 been good. Um, well, one one the thing I wanted to bring up was. Like, I I've heard from quite a few autistic people that you know antidepressants like Prozac and things like that are supposed to treat depression and panic disorder and anxiety, um, things of that nature. But I have found, particularly in my own life, that antidepressants tend to make my anxiety a lot worse. Oh, it so, can like, happen. Yeah. Um, any like any of the the ones Prozac, Citalopram, Sertraline, um, they all higher my anxiety up quite a bit, and mm -hmm. and so I have to pair it with an anti anxiety medication. Oh, yeah, um, which, which in this case is metazapine. Um, so I always have to have like equal doses or equal effective doses of each yeah. um, at the same time, and. Um, I mean, it, it kind of works to a certain degree. It's just like actually, like I was thinking about the sedative medication and psychotic 
sedatives are, are just absurdly sedating. <laughs> and I, I I really struggle. Even even now, I've been on it for maybe four four or five years. Yeah. And even now, I struggle to wake up in the morning and feel awake. Yeah, definitely. And until like one p.m., two p.m. at the max, and um, and when I have them, it's it's also a a really potent um, appetite stimulant. So I have them, and then I I, I had a pre previous issue with uh, bulimia when I was younger. Um, kind of kind of got past it. Um, but when I started taking metazapine, it, it, the appetite stimulant like restarted, um, the, the binge purging thing. And then, you know, eventually I sort of managed to get rid of the purging aspect of it because my teeth are just oh, falling apart. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, now I'm left with a binging disorder. <laughs> so I'm, I'm constantly trying to monitor and like, control my weight all the time and it's it's uh it's a really big it's it's come to a point where it's real real issue i think i might be i might go and go to the doctor and see if i can get any treatment for it i realize that you haven't gone through your entire story <laughs> of that <laughs> things Do, is there is there much much left that you want to, uh, to say no. on it? um i just wanted to say that i am better now still not maybe the best i still get uh, episodes of depression quite severe severe yeah um, mm. but i am definitely better after all this these years and what I've, what made what made an impact like what what changed mm -hmm. and so i would say that definitely finding out that i'm autistic made a big difference i was mm. able to understand myself better um also, I would say that my advocacy online uh, helped me too, to just know that I am helping other people, uh, yeah. autistic or holistic, to understand uh, better autism and mental health. Um, well, yeah, um, I don't have many friends, but those uh, who I have are really helping me too. Good. Um, my boyfriend also, um, uh, yeah, and um, therapy wasn't really um doing that much that I expected it to be. Kind of, um, maybe not a a fix for all my problems, but um, it. Do you think me. it's gonna be like a lot more effective yes, than it I is? Def just yeah. considering like how readily it's used <laughs> yeah and um meds also help me um get out of bed or mm. do chores um sure. yeah Good. that's well, my story <laughs> <laughs> well thank thank you very much for sharing that um i feel a bit no i in an ideal world I w i'd want to to have a little think about that because that's you know like you've done so well just uh like get get through it all and and yes. and come out the other side and I, I I totally get you like when I was when I was younger oh, I was it was a constant battle to try and keep myself alive all the yes. time and keep myself safe and you know even even though I'm not in that state where I'm where I can't function at all or talk or you know for, sort of care care for myself mm -hmm. um. I still get periods of time, like maybe one or two months in a year where like depression is like really bad. And yes. um, I think that's, it's a really good, good point to highlight because it, you know, it's, it's a very long, although it's very depressing to think about, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it is a very, very long process. And, yes. um, but I would like, to say that anybody that I have talked to who, you know, who've, who've come out the other side and done done work on themselves, understanding themselves, like they they always, you know, say that it was worth it to, to yes. stick through and to 
you know, try and make something positive of the, the negative experiences. Yeah, I think it's always worth it, despite of how hard it is. And I actually didn't mention that when I was taken to the hospital that second time, I um, made my goodbyes and I maybe uh, there's no, recently no, no. a debate online on whether you should say commit suicide or... um you know, die by suicide, but I can't find another word to describe to describe sure. what I wanted yeah. to do. So I wanted to commit suicide, and this time um, I'm not gonna describe the method, but I was sure I'm gonna do it. So if I wasn't taken to that hospital for this, um, how is that called? Um, this treatment. Uh, yeah. Um, I wouldn't be here today. That's also important to mention with our topic we're yeah. discussing. Yeah, I think that that's that's definitely very important. Um, yes, I had something in my mind that's just slipped away. <laughs> you know what I want to ask because we, we've talked a lot about your your personal story, yes. Amelia, and. You know, I think I think it's it's always good to to have that that personal aspect, but yeah, you know, in the context of the forty forty podcast being about autism, would you be would you be up for doing a bit of theorizing on uh, what on the ways that mental health may be different for autistic people? Yeah, sure. I think I think for me that the the biggest thing that I am talking talking about a lot, pretty much all the time, um, is alexithymia. And yes, how that can have like a massive, massive impact on uh, how you manage mental health, but also like the development of it. For for anybody who doesn't know, even even though I talk about it all the time, <laughs> I like find me as a difficulty noticing and categorizing emotions, and I like to visualize it as a threshold condition. Um, around around 90, 90 plus percent of autistic people are alexithymic. Like most most people can notice, like if if we take anxiety as as an example, uh, most people will be able to notice if they're like twenty thirty percent anxious on a scale from one one to a hundred. And um, no, for for people for autistic people people who are alexithymic, like it's almost like like it needs to get higher in order for us to notice it and to know what it is. So like maybe 60, 70, 80%. Um, and you know, quite, quite often at that point, once you've, once your anxiety is that high, it's having like real impacts on your, your functioning and your, your well being, And it's, it's very difficult to kind of adjust, adjust what you're doing or, or try and help yourself on, on a, um situation by situation basis i think it's it's really important especially with depression because um i find it very i i can sort i can sort of um i've developed ways of of going around my difficulty with alexithymia like noticing body set bodily sensations behavior changes um you know th things like that I, I can do that quite well with anxiety and I can gauge it a lot better. But depression's a different thing because it's 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 a bit sneaky. Um and lo not not a lot of people even even if they develop depression know that they're depressed. Or they they're kind of a bit like in denial about being depressed because it's just like such a cognitive um thing, you know. You only really see the presentation of depression when it's quite severe, you know, when people can't move or function or like, you know, it affects your tone of voice and your your, yes. your face and, you know, um, I saw, and so it's really, really hard uh, for some people to kind of say, look, I feel depressed <laughs> and sort of get early diagnosis and early, early treatment and like things of that nature. Um, it also makes sort of living day to day with it quite hard because people will ask you how you are and 
you know, the predominant two emotions that I have is anxiety and depression um, most of the time. What's my depression like? What's my anxiety like? So instead of saying, I'm all right, or, you know, I'm not doing too good, I'll, I'll, I'll say, hmm. well, my legs feel this way, so I must be at least this percentage of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> and I have had, I have been having some very negative thought loops and some some sneaky sort of depression thoughts sneaking in there. So maybe I'm a little bit depressed, but I'm not too sure. And that's that's kind of how it goes um, with people that I'm comfortable around and I know very well. I just kind of say, you know, they ask me what my ratings are and I just give them a rating. Um, so in, in that way, it sometimes feels like the only two emotions that I can feel and can pay attention to um, are being depressed and anxious all the time. And I, I can't notice all of those other background emotions like happiness and and love and care and excitement and things like that because they're not they're not strong enough and they're they're always like masked under a blanket of anxiety and depression um and and that makes it that makes me feel worse because i'm like well what what do i have around me that's giving me joy and positivity and yeah it po possibly there are things that are doing that, but I just, I can't notice it. Um, yeah. So th that's, that's, that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like spire is a massive, massive thing. Do you have any, any particular, you know, things that you, you think may be different? Um, so I think it may be different because our um, executive functioning is different. Mm. Um, with with neurodiversity, not only with autism but in ADHD or in other conditions, there's problems with or differences with executive functioning. Yeah. We may put uh, put off tasks or just don't have the energy to do it, um, and it mm, it's. I imagine it is hard to treat with ter therapy um, mm. when you kind of feel unable to do it either way with with the tools that therapy gives you. Your body just doesn't want to. Um, and so a, lot, a lot of therapy is it's kind of you have to do things. Yes. So it's like yes. it's adding, oh, I'm going for therapy for executive functioning. <laughs> yeah. uh, you need to do this, this, and this on top of what you're already doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and uh, the, and the other thing, I think that we have a tendency to have more um, repeating thoughts. Mm. Uh, I don't want to compare it to OCD, but uh, it's like a hyper focus. Yes. Like and these thoughts just come back and come back no matter what we do, how do we treat it, um, how we treat it. Um, they just always kind of uh, are there, um, mm. even when we are actively trying to um, deal with them, maybe not stop them because that's not always possible, but um, yeah, manage them better they still uh, can find a way to come back to us. I think that it impacts how autistic people uh, experience and treat mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, the other thing is masking. I think that um, when I didn't know I was autistic yet, I... Thing I was masking too, um, without knowing it, sure. and I think I did it in therapy, and that did have yeah. an impact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'm not alone. <laughs> yes, masking in therapy, like yes. they're, they're therapizing a mask. Yes, yes. It's a really good point. I did mm -hmm. not think about that. <laughs> 
I think, um, you know, what you said about executive, executive functioning, it's, you know, a really great point because, um, you know, often one of the downstream effects of anxiety and depression is to make functioning a lot harder or more difficult or not as worthwhile, um, like in your brain due to all the chemical differences and stuff. And, um, you know, if, if you already have like an existing difficulty with sort of managing life in yourself, it doesn't take a lot of low mental health for it to like start affecting you. Like, yes. you know, I, I sometimes notice, you know, if, if I'm feeling anxious or, or depressed or something along those lines, I kind of look back in hindsight and I'm like, I, I've, I've not started to eat not as much or I, I've started to forget to brush my teeth or you know it's 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 almost like my my body's craving to be like dissociated yeah from from my body from my mind from my body like it's it's trying to sort of escape my my current reality or my current feelings and thoughts um and like things you know things like just scrolling through your phone or watching a video um, you now turns from a tool to help me transition to uh, something that I can't start watching. And then suddenly like I'm glued in a single <laughs> spot for about three or four hours. Yes. It's very, very strange in, in certain areas. You know, I can still work. I can still like do my online stuff and things, but nowadays, but it's, it's, it's almost like the, the other parts of my life that, to do with executive like cleanliness and hygiene and food and you know things like that just seem to take a back seat a lot more now one thing that i wanted to i mean it's it's kind of related to i was going to talk about emotional regulation but i feel it's kind of very similar to alexithymia in that sense like oh yeah we just regulate ourselves differently than holistic people hmm. and um, it definitely has some impact on how we um, receive the mental health care or services or how we experience mental health. Yeah, because I, I supp- you know, as, I suppose a lot about sort of learning to manage and live with mental health conditions is well, <laughs> regulating yourself due to what I said about alexithymia and, you know, things like that. Emotional regulation can be very difficult. Um, it's hard to know that it's there. It's hard to, to know what will help and what's causing it. And it's only in hindsight, when you look back, you're like, Ooh, there's that, that, and that, that's probably why, um, which isn't very helpful, especially if it's like an acute sort of depression, anxiety, panic attack or something like that. Um, you, you know, you could do with the information and the, the way forward, in your brain in that instant um it's just very hard to access is there is there anything else that you wanted to touch on around sort of differences i think that this all i can think of okay. yeah oh, th- there was one last thing that i wanted to talk about which was bad social experiences and trauma ah yeah you know con- considering that we're so rampantly bullied like um i'm isolated and we have all these these low quality of life statistics it's easy to see why autistic people are struggling more i did my as part of my biomedical sciences degree i i researched into sort of did a literature review so i reviewed different research papers over a hundred or so and um the only real solid piece of information about like any biological links was to do with anxiety and social anxiety, mm-hmm. which makes sense. Um, but it still didn't explain why, why there's just such absurd statistics around suicide and depression and eating disorders. And like, it just, yeah. just seems like autistic people are just comorbid with everything like yeah. <laughs> everything that's bad it's it's almost like there's a lot of environmental things that are going on that we can't control and they're affecting us quite badly <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know 
Um, I thought that was just this important to to touch on because you know it's yeah. a massive, massive, massive source of um, mental health difficulties. That Definitely, early yeah. early life trauma kind of thing. Yes, I think that you know the sort of rounding up to the end of the podcast but i think it's it would be important to touch on this do you do you think there are any barriers to autistic people managing and seeking support like thinking thinking about your ex, your experiences with mental health what stopped you from actually um getting better and getting help mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that being undiagnosed is mm. um, is definitely a, a barrier. Um, because, like a misdiagnosis. Yeah. And... Oh, yes, yes, also. Mm. Um, um, what else? Difficulty with making friends or romantic partners. Um, they are important to our mental health, but... Well, it's not really with with the mental health services, um, but maybe the psych wards aren't adapted to us. There are uh, bright lights and the food is, well... <laughs> it made <laughs> not it sound really. very good for what you were saying. <laughs> yes, and in the UK or USA or anywhere else, it's probably there aren't many places that will um, accommodate you with your food Um, it's also important to find a therapist or a doctor who knows how to work with autistic patients maybe they were on a um, course how to do it Um, I know that there are such courses for professionals Um, and maybe uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Alexis Saimia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis uh, Saimia. Yes, it can also be a, a barrier because you may you may have you may struggle with realizing that something is actually wrong, or realize it too um, too late, maybe. Mm. Yeah. You say it's a lot. It's a lot harder to deal with when you're younger. Oh, yes. I mean, it's, it's, you know, as you, as you grow and your knowledge expands and, you know, um, you learn about autism and you learn about yourself, it, it becomes a bit more manageable, but yes. Yes. it does, it just, I, I just think back to my life through my eyes when I was, you know, like 13, 14, 15, um, it's, it's almost like I was just kind of in this, this dream, like environment and i was so separated from my emotional brain that i i felt like my brain was split into different modes or parts like my thinking and my emotional brain were just so yeah. detached from each other each other um which made it really difficult for therapy because most of the time they engaged with the thinking part of my brain <laughs> like <laughs> what i thought about it rather than what i felt about it yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, there's, there's one thing that I really wanted to highlight around sort of barriers and the, the amount of, uh, specialized psychotherapy for autistic people, um, is very, very sparse, especially well, for me, like my, my, my parents have obviously put in a lot of work to try and you know, helped me with my conditions when I was younger mm-hmm. and they could not find for the life of them a mental health uh, practitioner, someone who, a psychotherapist, some, anything like that, that specialized in autistic people. Yeah. Um, and the ones that were, were very far away, requiring lots of executive functioning and travel, yeah. Yeah. as well as money. Yes, it's, for, for my I employed imagine. unemployed self. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a massive one. We need to see more. It's well in the in the UK. We need to see more. Um, sort of NHS workers and people who um do 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 this kind of thing, do psychotherapy to actually like 
specialize in autism because it's really yes. really needed um and everywhere else to be honest i, do, I just yeah, know specifically about about the uk but and also we need we need some more research around autism and comorbidities um, yeah i know it's a bit of a, like a on the edge of your seat kind of oh <laughs> research scientists oh we don't like those but um they they do i mean a lot of the stuff that we know about autism and you know the the things that we've we've built on in life as as autistic people and like our ideas and concepts and stuff yeah they've all come from at some point some some level of research or some level of understanding and um what we really don't understand which is very apparent to me is is why we have such poor life life outcomes yes um yes. why we why we die 20 years younger than the average person which is absolutely ridiculous um you know why so many uh, uh, even autistic children um contemplate suicide and um and and die uh you know this understanding those comorbidities could be absolutely massive because we could actually start making making treatment around comorbidities rather than you know all of some of the medical community being focused on treating autism yeah. like we need to treat the causes of the anxiety and depression and eating disorders and yes understand them. Else. yeah exactly um so th th those are two things that i i feel quite quite strongly about as as really big barriers at the moment but um you know obviously the biggest barrier of all is trying to trying to to get these opinions these statistics these stories heard by the rest of the world yes and actually acted upon yeah we um, are all, all not always uh, often dismissed just because we are autistic that yeah uh, our struggles don't matter because it's supposed to be like that or um, exactly yeah yeah autism low life quality most people's minds are like well they're obviously it's like the one in the same yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like no no if you have the right adjustments and the right environment and the right people and the right support uh very high life outcomes from a few of my friends that i know um it's just the rest of us <laughs> yeah um i think we'll, we'll we'll end those those questions there i well I, I want to sort of give you give you space to kind of you know put out a message a message out there because um you know you you've been through these these awful horrific experiences and you've been so open and honest and and amazing about talking about them um very brave as well and you know i if in in your mind if you're you're thinking of other people sort of listening to us speaking and you know someone who's going through a similar circumstance or you know struggling with their mental health what what would you like to to say to them so i would definitely say that there is always hope no matter how um how bad it seems how you feel that there isn't any other um exit or it things won't get better and maybe they won't get better tomorrow today or even in a month but i promise that it's worth it it's worth it to get treatment to talk about how you're feeling um to yeah take care of yourselves and um, uh, just uh, just trust the process i guess um but i i promise that suicide is not the only option and to people who maybe know someone who is struggling or um, maybe don't know but want to help, then I would say always believe an autistic person when they say that they are feeling suicidal, depressed, anxious, 
it's really important to believe them and um, take take the action um mm. offer them help offer them a hug maybe if they feel comfortable doing so offer them date their sorry your time um and if they are in immediate danger then of course call um 911 or uh, yeah so the police or an ambulance just uh, just be there for them yeah Thank you, Amelia. That was, was brilliant. I I remember. Do you know earlier when I said that I forgot something? I've I've remembered what I was going to, what I was going to say, um, just just from from hearing you speak um, around sort of attempted suicides and stuff. Um, I feel people have a predilection to sort of label people as attention seekers yes. when something like this happens. Uh, but you know, in both of our circumstances, we had attempted, and then later on learned more about it, and actually, you know, made made it made a proper a proper attempt on our life, and and yes, you know, so it's it's important to take people seriously, even if it's even if it's just an attempt, even though you have some met some voice in the back of your head telling you that. There is trying to seek attention. It's better. It's 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 in all circumstances. You should you should take it as as what it is, and yes. it's it's a very serious thing. Yes, you never know if the person will actually try it. If they tell you that they will, you believe them. Just even just like you said, even if you think uh, to yourself that they are seeking attention. Well, humans are uh, <laughs> humans are naturally seeking attention, but um, <laughs> seeking talking... attention for a reason. Yes, like... yes, and um, well, yeah, I I just think it's really important to always believe the person when they tell you about how they are feeling recently. I felt I feel like we've really we've really gone over a lot. Um, and I guess you know what. What I'm really interested to to know is, um, what is your song of the day? What is what is the the song that um, that really sort of that that moves you and that you know sort of represents you know your your, your difficulties in the past and yeah that kind of thing. Um, well, it's not really a song that represents maybe my difficulties. But I uh, chose the Golden Years, but by David Bowie, because it is a song that gives me hope. It's really um, happy, and it reminds me of my boyfriend who played a huge role in um, getting me out of the darkest place I ever been in. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Well, this comes to the end of the podcast. I I hope that you've all got something from this, and you know, if you, if you do feel at all like this has made you feel worse, <laughs> please please contact one of your your local mental health people, um, or or ring somebody, or or give someone a text message, um, one of the the crisis numbers that you have. I I, I won't go for every single crisis number for every country, but um. You know, don't, don't just sit with it if it's if it's um, something that's that's affected you. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I I hope that when we finish this this podcast, that you'll have a you know you have a good think about it, and that it's it will make some some positive improvements on on your life or the way that you you view mental health and suicide. Um, you know, I, Amelia, you've been absolutely amazing talking about this. Like it's. It's it's pretty much the <laughs> one of the most emotive, difficult topics that one can seek to talk about. And yes, um, you just you've been absolutely amazing. So thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Follow artistic positivity. 
Follow on Instagram. Follow uh, Asperger's Growth on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so yes, uh, if you do want to to follow my work, you can head over to my Instagram, Facebook, on YouTube. We have some videos around dating. We have sort of biweekly Q and A's around around dating. We have some topic topic sessions. We've got some a running series called Dating an Autistic, which um, if you are uh, dating an autistic person, uh, it may be good to to look into. You can also find the podcast of course on on youtube um as well as on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, pretty much all of them and if you want to get in contact with me for anything to do with speaking or training or modeling or anything of of that nature um you can head over to my website thomashanley.co.uk and um there is a contact page there for you to to get in touch thank you of course to all of my youtube um subscribers or joiners i don't know what the gang part of my gang on youtube <laughs> give me a small amount of monetary support per month thank you i appreciate that a lot and of course massive thank you as always to mr patrick Vetti for always being behind me and always supporting me on the sidelines and sort of helping me push myself in my dark moments and um yeah um massive thank you to all of you like massively appreciated yeah i we come to the most difficult part of the podcast for me which is transitioning from uh talking to <laughs> talking to another person for an hour and a half or something so, <laughs> um i guess have you have you got any any um plans for the rest of the day um i think i'm going to play on my nintendo 2ds nice. Yeah, I don't two, have the switch. Yeah, it's the two. The two DS. <laughs> yeah. I I I have I got the the three DS a while back. Oh, I and, had that um, too. The the screen is just like it's like it's cool, but it's yeah, so I had that too, and it was too tiny. I don't know if you have the uh, camera open, but this is a lot bigger than this is the XL one. And yeah. this is a lot better. I was playing Animal Crossing on the Oh, 3DS. I love Animal Crossing. <laughs> and the screen was just so tiny. And yeah. yeah. Do you know and if the... Animal Crossing does uh, like cross platform? Is it New Horizons that you've got or is it the original? I had the New Leaf one. New Leaf, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I also played Wild World, so <laughs> that was uh not the first, but I also played the first on the the GameCube. <laughs> oh, oh, I remember that. <laughs> uh, you'll have to you have to send me some pictures of your your town. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I'd like to see, I'd like to see your town. Okay. <laughs> I'm always really interested. I, I wish that I could play more, but I I, I just yeah, you're um, busy, busy man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunate. With us rambling, I think it's probably a good time to say goodbye. And um, again, Amelia, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, all of you, for <laughs> tuning in and listening to us. I hope that you got something for it. And I hope that you have a lovely day, as always. Thank you for having me. Goodbye. Of course, of course. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs>